Previously, I had discussed the spectrum of hydrogen. Now, in this picture here, you're looking at the spectrum of helium. And what I want you to notice is you don't have the same kind of characteristic spacing of lines. There's a faint bluish line here. There's sort of a more teal line here, big orange line here. It's a faint red line. Um, but the thing is, you don't have the same kind of um, spacing of lines that you did when we were looking at uh, hydrogen over here. Here you can see that as you get to shorter and shorter wavelengths, the spacing of the lines is getting closer and closer together. And that is not what's happening when we take a look at uh, helium. So why do we have this kind of a difference? And the boils down to the fact that helium is a multi-electron atom. In other words, there's more than one electron. So instead of just thinking about how the electron interacts with the proton, in a system like helium, um, we're going in the ground state, um, let's say it's helium-4, you're going to have a nucleus here that uh, has two protons and two neutrons. Now the neutrons don't do anything for the charge, but so we end up with the nucleus having a charge of plus two. But now the thing is, is that we have two electrons in orbit. And I'm drawing a semi-classical kind of picture here. And here you would be mostly interacting with the nucleus in the middle, but there would be a bit of a repulsion, say, between these two electrons here. And if we think about how they could be seen in different points in the orbit, like, say, instead of that electron being there, we put it over here, let's say. Um, sorry, I did not mean for that to look like I was emitting photons, so let me fix that. Um, just trying to indicate that I've moved my electron. So if instead my electron were here, I guess I'll just use a dotted line to indicate that. Now these two electrons are kind of close to each other, strongly repelling, and they're being more weakly attracted to the nucleus than they are repelling each other. And so this will have an effect on the energy and the energies of the valence electrons in the atom, or actually all the electrons in the atom for that matter. And that's going to change up um, the, uh, the po position of the, uh, the, the, change up the energy levels. Um, we can further go into that and say, take a look at an atom like uh, lithium, let's say. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at lithium here. Lithium is going to have a charge of plus 3e here. And so what's going to happen here is the n equals 1 shell is going to have two electrons in it. And actually they're going to be super duper close to the proton because while these are interacting with each other, it's going to be interacting a lot more with the plus 3 nucleus in the middle. And then hanging way out over here somewhere, it's going to be our one lone valence electron. So in this case here, lithium is going to look more hydrogen-ish um, because most of the spectral transitions we'll see will involve this valence electron going to higher and lower orbits. And this electron is mostly going to see basically a com composite plus 3 and minus 1. So depending on uh, um, how filled a valence shell is or isn't, it can look more or less like hydrogen. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and, so, and uh, start to think about um, how this is going to work out. So one of the things that we're going to have to pay attention to is something called the Pauli exclusion principle.
Um, a lot of people way overstated is you can't have uh, two things in the same place at the same time, and that isn't. It's more subtle than that. So, first off, we're going to have to um, define a couple of terms here, and to do that, we're going to have to take a look at what happens when you quantum mechanically think about systems with more than one identical particle. So let's say we're thinking about, let, let's think about helium, for instance, and the two electrons um, in the helium, just to give it some sense here. Um, when I write the wave function for my two electrons, um, this is that capital R psi that I defined earlier, um, and you're solving the Schrodinger equation for it, what you actually end up having to do is you have to write it as a function of the positions of both of the electrons. And this is because if I'm just looking over here and I decide to make an observation, I've got two electrons here, I, don't, I can't paint little numbers on the electrons. I don't know if this is electron one or electron two. And I don't know if this is electron two or electron one. Um, so when we, because these particles are completely indistinguishable from each other, um, I have to construct the wave function handling both of them simultaneously. And then here's the kicker. I, because I don't know which electron I'm observing, this means if I were to swap R1 and R2, the position of the two electrons in my wave function, I have to have the same probability of detecting the particle at that location because I don't know which one I'm looking at. So just like with, you know, detecting photons, we said the square of the electric field or for that matter, the square of the magnetic field strength gives us the probability of detecting the photon it's the square of the wave function that gives us the probability of detecting a particle, in this case, the electrons in, involved. So the, prob so the probability of detecting the electron will be um, the square of the wave function. And what I need is if I swap R1 and R2 in my wave function, I have to have the same probability of detecting the particle. So if I go and take the square root of both sides here, it turns out that I have two way, two, two possible conditions for the um, that the wave condition could wave function could satisfy, and to meet meet this condition, one possibility is I could have it if I swap them. I just get the same thing back out. So that's one possibility. Or I could have it that when I swap them, I get the negative. So <clears throat> it turns out that both of these are possible. Um, you know, so because either way, if I square it, I would end up with the same thing. So let's take a look at the first case here. Um, so particles where if I swap them, I end up with the same wave function I had before, no change in sign. These are called bosons. After the Indian physicist Bosa, who thought a lot about them. Um, and so there are plenty of particles that do this. Um, a photon is an example of a boson. Um, there are plenty of other particles that are bosons. And then the other class of particles where we get the minus sign 
when I swap the two particles in the wave function. These are called fermions after Enrico Fermi, um, an Italian physicist who uh, did who thought about not just this kind of stuff, but he also proposed the existence of the neutrino. Um, so it, both kind so certain particles, nature decides this is the solution to this identical particle uh, problem that it'll take, and for other particles it decides it'll be the fermion choice. So the deal here is with the both with the fermions especially. Um, if I'm going to be swapping R1 and R2, I have to think about what happens when R1 equals R2. When R1 equals R2, I would need it that if I swap my R1 and R2, so I'll just put in R1 for R2 here. Um, so at that time, it would have to be equal to the negative of itself. There is only one value for which that would be true. So when R1 equals R2, in other words, we say the two, that we would be wondering if the two particles are in the same location, we get that um, the wave function would be equal to zero which means the probability of detecting either particle there would be zero. This is not true for bosons. Bosons are perfectly happy um, to have more than one particle in the same location. Um, now it works out that nature does it is at least kind in how it divvies this up for us. Um, bosons, it turns out, are particles where the spin um, is equal to an integer. Fermions are particles where the spin is equal to an odd half integer. So usually a half could be three halves. Um, I guess other things are possible, but this is all you're ever really going to see. Um, so for fermions, what this means is that <clears throat> if I swap them, they can't be in the same place. Now there is a caveat to that. Um, also buried into all this will be th um, will be the quantum numbers, and so it is okay um, for fermions to be in the same place. So for fermions to be in the same place, they have to have different quantum numbers. Okay. So with that thought in mind, this puts a limit into how many particles I can put into any particular shell. So, for in, in, in an atom. So if we start thinking about how many electrons um, can I place into Um, let's say the n equals 1 shell. So every electron will, in the n equals 1 shell will have to have a different quantum number. Well, you're already starting with n equals 1, so that's all you got. Um, so I'm free to have L run anywhere from 0 to n minus 1. Oh wait, that's 0 to 0. So they can be n or L. So how about m sub l? Um, m sub l can run from minus l to l. Oh wait, that's running from zero to zero. What about, but we're not done. We also have the magnetic spin quantum number. Remember the spin quantum number is always a half, so we never bother writing it down. Um, we can have plus a half, spin up. 
and I could also have minus a half. And that's it. In the n equals 1 shell, this is all the possible quantum numbers I can have. And so the answer is I can put two electrons into the n equals 1 shell. All right, let's expand this thought. How about the n equals 2 shell? All right, so here with the n equals 2 shell, um, so we'll just I start by putting down some 2s. Um, again, L can run from 0 to n minus 1. Well, 2 minus 1 is 1, so L can run from 0 to 1. So let's take a look at the possibilities with zeros. Again, we've got the same deal. M sub L can only be 0 because it runs from minus 0 to plus 0. Um, and that means that we have the same plus and minus a half. So, so this would this bit right here, this corresponds to one s. This much would correspond to two s. And often when people are writing this sort of thing, if the shell is would be full, they would write something like two s two like that. But we'll just say this is the two s subshell. All right, but there's more quantum numbers we can pick. Um, so L could also be equal to 1 because remember L can run from 0, zero up to n minus 1. We took care of 0. Now let's look at all the possibilities when L is equal to 1. When L is equal to 1, M sub L can run from minus L to L. So this means that now m sub l can have values running from minus 1 up to 1, plus 1. And within each of those, we're free to have plus and minus a half for the spin. So Everything here would be the 2p subshell. But if I look at all of this together, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 electrons that I can fit into the n equals 2 shell. Um, and then we could expand this same idea up for um, n equals 3. Um, I can stick 10 into the 3d subshell. So I can put 2 into 3s, I can put 6 into 3p, just like before. And I'll leave it for you to amuse yourself and work out that in the 3d subshell you can put 10. So it's a grand total of 18 that can go into the n equals 3 shell, and so forth. So with, mul with uh, multi-electron atoms now, what we're going to see here is that since we have the electron-electron interaction, that's going to change the... Um, energy values um, due to the electron-electron interactions. And in fact, unlike hydrogen, where it didn't matter what L was equal to, we're going to see that for some sort of multi-electron atom, you might still have, like, say, 1s sitting down here in our term diagram. Let's say this is the ionization threshold here, ionization limit here. Um, but now what will happen is, is that um, this could this would be 2s, for instance, here, and then 2p, um, because of the different shape of the orbitals, will be a little more energetic. And then similarly, you can have it where, you notice know, it looks like 3s, then you'll have like 3p, 3d, something like that. And it's not unheard of for it to actually be the case that 4s, in this case is actually, I'm trying to draw it, that in this case 4s, for this hypothetical atom, might end up to be slightly lower energy than 3d. That's actually pretty common. Uh, it's also pretty common for 4d to be less than 5s um, and so forth. And so this is going to 
has something to say about how we're going to be filling electrons um, into our shells. So let me just finish this off. Oops, oh, sorry, 4D. Um, then we'll have 4F here. And then 5S will usually be above 4P, but below 4D. And I'm not going to bother drawing the n equals 5 levels, but I just, again, want to show that at now, because of the electron-electron interactions, we, in addition to the principal quantum number, the angular momentum quantum number now has something to say about the total energy. So this gets us to thinking about um, what does a ground state configuration look like for a typical atom? And the way you can do this is via Hund's rule. Now, if you've had chemistry before, I urge you not to completely tune out um, because a lot of well-meaning chemistry instructors oversimplify Hund's rule a bit. The actual statement of the rule is very straightforward. Um, so, but the it, there's some subtleties in, in application that we need to deal with. So the idea with Hund's rule is that you play a game of imagining that you add one electron at a time and to you know, you know, in, into our into our shells and the idea will be that subsequent electrons will go into the lowest available energy state. So now there are some rules of thumb, but they're not 100% stringent, and I'll talk about some exceptions to this. So generally, unpaired spins, and th th this one's pretty good, unpaired spins have lower energy than paired spins. And generally speaking, but there are exceptions. Spin pairing is preferable is preferable to going to the next higher suborbital. Okay, so let's go ahead and work through a few examples of that. So a lot of times you'll see well-meaning chemistry teachers do things where they'll draw boxes like this, 1s, 2s, and they'll draw like a triple of boxes here for 2p and so forth. And then they start drawing arrows into them. That's helpful as far as it goes, but it runs you a it runs you into danger of incorrectly predicting electron levels, and also gives you some danger about thinking too much about spin pairing. Because usually, what they'll do is they'll go ahead and draw in. They'll say spin up, then we do spin down, spin up, spin down, 
spin up, spin up, spin up, spin down, spin down, spin down. It doesn't really work that way. Um, if we just have one electron sitting in the orbital, um, we don't know whether it's up or down until we look at it. If we have two in the orbital, then we know it's spin up or spin down um, if we look at it. Um, or Well, I should say, if we have two in the subshell, then we know that one of them is spin up and the other is spin down. But again, we don't know which is which um, until we look at it. So I think it's a little deceptive to go and draw these pictures. So I'm just going to say I'm not a fan. Um, the second reason for that is when you get to more complicated structures. But let's go ahead and start with a straightforward structure. Like let's say we were doing something like working out the electron structure of carbon. So as I'm filling my subshells, I can think about my quantum numbers. So lowest available quantum number is one. Um, I need to put, so I can only have L is zero. Um, and then I can have plus a half and minus a half. And like I said, I kind of got to write one of them down, but it doesn't really matter which one. So, but the issue here is that, okay, my first two electrons are going to be plus one half. Um, sorry, my bad. I need to put in uh, M sub L here, which is a zero for everybody. And then I'll say M sub S could be plus a half for one of them and minus a half for another one. And that's okay because with carbon, I've got six electrons to place. So why did I write a six there? I had six on my brain. Okay. So I've placed my first two electrons um, because if I take a look at pretty much any energy level diagram, 1s is going to have a much lower energy than 2s. And so even though spin pairing raises the energy, it won't raise it so much that it would be preferable to go into 2s. And then the same thing as we start placing our um, into n equals 2, 2s here will have a lower energy than 2p and enough lower that it would not be energetically preferable to start putting electrons into 2p before you put them into 2s. All right. And then now it's saying, okay, now we have to go into 2p. And now when you're saying m sub l, Unless you have a magnetic field, you don't know which one it's in. It's going to be in some sort of combination state of all of them. Um, and so again, this is why I'm not particularly a fan of putting things down. Um, so I'll just say um, that will go into two out of um, minus one, zero, and plus one. And as far as the spins go, um, we will have unpaired spins. So one of them will have, say, negative one, another zero, or maybe one of them's negative one and plus one, one of them is zero, and, or maybe one zero and the other's plus one. Just two out of these three possibilities. Um, so definitely, if anyone was his, de definitely don't think that this is going minus one, zero, one, or anything like that. Um, I've seen well-meaning chemistry instructors do that. Now that is fair if you are going to stick the whole thing into a magnetic field, then that does tilt the scales and you would be putting them in that way. All right. So, but anyway, that's how we would fill it out. And so usually the way we, you'd write this configuration, since this is 2s and we've got two electrons sitting there, we've got 2p, two electrons sitting there. And sorry, uh, my, 
I'm sorry, 1s with two, two electrons sitting there, um, 2s with two electrons sitting there, and 2p with two electrons sitting there. We usually write the configuration as 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So that would be the ground state configuration for carbon. And if you have anything else, it would be an excited state at a higher energy. But to show that this doesn't always work out this way, um, sometimes you get it where energy levels are so closely spaced that spin pairing actually, that, that, um, that is actually preferable to go into a different state than to spin pair. So let's go and just take a look at the sequence from atomic number 76 to atomic number 79. So atomic number 76, that is um, osmium. Um, and if you go and look, look it up, you'll see that the ground state configuration of osmium, um, a lot of times people will do something like write xenon in brackets here to just say the entire, fill, you know, the entire filled collection of the most recent noble gas and then we'll start writing from there so you know the entire electron structure of xenon and then we add on top of it for osmium we we will have 4f 14 um 5d 6 6s2 All right, that seems reasonable enough. And then you can go and take a look at something like iridium. Um, so iridium, which is atomic number 77, will have the entire structure of xenon plus 4F 14, 5D7, um, 6S2. And remember, 6S was a lower energy state than 5D, so that's okay. Um, that's why we're filling the 6S first and then the 5, 5D. All right, so far so good. Now let's take a look at 78. 78 is platinum. And that one is the, um, the entire structure of xenon. Again, 4F14, so we'll take that. Um, then it turns out you have 5D9, um, 6S1. So now, what the heck, and then let's just finish off with um, element 79, which is gold. That will be the entire filled structure of xenon again. And that one turns out to be um, 4F14, 5D10, 6S1. And then finally, actually, if we take this to include mercury, um, so Z equals 80, again, the entire field structure of mercury, um, that one will have a ground state configuration of xenon plus 4F14, um, 5D10, um, and 6S2 kind of bringing sanity back. So anyway, what the heck is going on right here where suddenly we decide that rather than spin pairing in 6S2, we left 6S1 unpaired. Well, the deal is, is that in this particular neck of the woods in the periodic table, um, 6S is here, 6s is just barely less energetic than 5d. Now, 
as I add electrons, the electron-electron interaction winds up being such that after I put one electron in here, um, so, it, so if I, after I put one electron in here, like this, if I were to spin pair this, spin pairing this with, so I'll draw the hypothetical spin paired arrangement, spin paired would raise the energy too much and would be above 5D. So it's actually preferable here to leave the 6S unpaired and put more electrons into 5D. Um, so you'll find a few places in the periodic table where you have this kind of thing happening. And if you just slavishly draw all the boxes the well-meaning um, chemistry teachers do, you can mess up these configurations. Um, so you, you have to pay a little bit of attention to it when you've got energy levels that are on knife's edge with respect to each other. Um, spin pairing can actually push that state above the next energy level. And so it's actually preferable to leave something unpaired and then pair the rest of it. Um, okay, so that's probably some fun with Hun's rule there. Um, so like I say, that the proper version of Hun's rule is you always go to the next lower energy state. Um, it's unpaired spins have lower energy than paired spins. Um, and usually, but not always, the difference in energy between suborbitals is big enough that spin pairing is preferable. But when you get into especially higher atomic numbers, sometimes you run into cases where it's okay to leave an unpaired spin and then start filling a different orbital first, um, just because the, the, addition, the additional energy for spin pairing um, would uh, make it energetically unfavorable. So that's the proper version of Hun's rule. Always just go to the next lower energy state, but it isn't just the clean draw the boxes. So I'm not a fan of this. Um, it's helpful at, you know, for lower atomic numbers, it works out just fine. But as the atomic numbers go up, you have to take a little more care. And as long as they leave the boxes unlabeled and you understand that when you're dropping in the spins, you don't really know what they are, it's, it's okay. Um, but I'm not the biggest fan. I think it's just better to think it through. All right, so let's detour for a bit and talk about molecular structure. Um, And it works out the same way. You solve the Schrodinger equation. And it's actually a similar solution to doing that for multi-electron atoms, um, especially since the valence electrons end up being shared in bonds. Um, it really is the same thing where you write a wave function for all the shared electrons. Now, the difference in the solution is like, let's say you have some lower energy level. And some higher energy level. Um, what winds up happening is instead of just having a single energy for each of these, you actually get a band of very closely spaced energy levels. General rule of thumb, the difference between ground and excited state um, is about one to three EV-ish, something like that. But these are spaced very closely. And the reason we have so many is that we now have to allow for the molecule being able to rotate and vibrate. And remember, we've already seen that for any kind of oscillator, 
um, we can only have specific um, uh, energies for our vibrations and angular momentum is quantized as well so this ends up giving us a whole band of very closely spaced um, but not so close that they completely run together um, you can detect it if you measure carefully um, a band of closely spaced energy levels um, now what this means is in thermal equilibrium you're almost all of your molecules are going to be hanging down in like this one and maybe the one or two above it. Um, so um, at typical temperatures, typical temperatures, You're generally in the lowest, you know, couple, three, whatever, not that many um, energy levels. Um, I'll just say the lowest few. So what this means then is for our spectrum, um, if we are talking about um, exciting something, you're always going to be exciting from very near the bottom of the ground energy band, like so. But the thing is, is you could excite into any of the vibrational and rotational states. So I'll just draw a few of them to give some sense. Um, so all, all these excitations excitations are possible. Um, and then the next step though is that if you're sitting up high in um, one of these rotational or vibrational bands you will almost immediately de-excite and you'll emit a very long wavelength photon while you're doing it. I'm down to the lowest one or two bands, basically right down to the bottom of the band. And then when you de-excite, you're going to be um, de-exciting from uh, um, near the bottom of the band to pretty much anywhere in here, like so. Um, and then finally, there will be, you'll de excite within here to end up back down near the bottom. But anyway, this process here um, uh, when, when we take a look at the spectrum, um, so if I go ahead and plot the intensity of the light against wavelength, um, for this bit here that I drew in green, in uh, green. Um, you're going to get some sort of structure that looks like this, and there might even be some funky little bumps in it and stuff like that. Won't get into that. Um, anyway, this gets known as the absorption band. So this would be when I am, the, the spectrum I would get where I'm measuring how good of a job we're absorbing we'll see that we absorb, you know, at these shorter wavelengths, but then when we actually measure the light that's being emitted later, what I drew here in kind of a burnt orange, it'll be shifted over to longer wavelengths. This is the emission band. And so this phenomenon is, um, where you emit at longer wavelengths than you absorbed at, this phenomenon gets called fluorescence. So if you've ever seen those, you know, novelty glow in the dark things, um, you know, so someone's made a little cut out of a cartoon character or whatever, 
Um, and the idea is so you leave it out in the sunlight and then later when you look at it in a dark room, it glows this eerie green. Well, what it's doing is it's picking up ultraviolet photons from the sun. So you can't see them. Um, you can't see the photons that are being absorbed. And then uh, through fluorescence, the emission band shifts from the ultraviolet um, to the um, into the visible, and you see that kind of spooky green color in the emission band. Um, you can't find these as readily anymore, and this is a good thing. Um, but the the baby boom generation was particular um, some of them were particularly fond of these things called black light posters um you'd have a poster with something and then you would shine what they called a black light at it and you would get these additional details in the design um now the thing is is that what these black lights were were ultraviolet lamps turned out not to be such a good idea to be selling these things because all, um, exposure to ultraviolet helps to accelerate the formation of cataracts um, and so that's why you can't really find the, the black lights on the market except for um, like sci scientific demonstration purposes and stuff like that no one's really selling them for the posters anymore all right so that's fluorescence. So now for the rest of this here, um, I'm mostly going to be uh, talking about how we can excite and um, emit with, within atoms. Um, a lot of this also applies to molecules, but I'll focus it on atoms here. So let's go take a look at atomic excitation now. So if we take something like sodium, and I am not going to draw the entire term diagram for sodium. It's uh, too big of a pain. Um, and I'll shift it instead of putting the ionization limit. Normally you would write zero EV and make these negative numbers, but I'll we can shift zero to be at the ground state. Sometimes people do that. So I'll say that the energy at the ground state, which for sodium is 3S, um, is zero and then the ionization limit would be 5.14 eV. You could also write zero and negative 5.14 but the chart I'm referencing here did this and so that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, so anyway that's my 3s state will be sitting at there. Now 3p, um, the first excited state, um, that's actually sitting at 2.1 EV above 3S. So that's a pretty big um, difference um, to the ground state. Um, so for, and, and so then again, we will draw in some of the others as, as, we, as we want, but um, I'll go ahead and point out here, for instance, that um, the if I were to draw in the 5s state so I'm not drawing everything but 5s sits at 4.11 eV while um, and 5p will sit at 4.34 eV but 4d sits at 4.29 eV and 4f will sit at um, sorry, 4.28 EV, and 4F sits at 4.2929 EV. So if we think about Hun's rule and how we're filling, we would definitely prefer, um, if we were to keep, of course, this is the ground state, so we're done filling here, but th this is where it's talking, if we were going to talk about some atom with a higher atomic number, um, you would see that you would want to fill 5S and then you'd want to fill 4D before you think about 5P. Um, but again, we'll have to pay attention to how spin pairing might shift this. But anyway, back to this particular ground state. 
So for absorption, so for excitation, there are two ways that we can do this kind of thing. One possibility, um, now I'll just draw two generic energy levels here, is if I have a photon coming in, what that will do is that will raise the electron from a lower state to a higher state and the photon gets destroyed in the process. This is um, known, this is called absorption. But it doesn't have to be a photon. What if, say, I have an electron or some other particle going by? Um, in that case, if it's a particle, a couple of things happen. One, it's quite possible for the particle to still be there afterwards, um, because otherwise we would have problems with having destroyed matter. The particle is going to be there. What's going to happen, though, is that the energy of the particle um, will have decreased by this difference, um, E2 minus E1. So what we need is to make this process happen, we just need the energy of the particle, particle, to be greater than or equal to E2 minus E1. Here I need the energy of the photon to be exactly E2 minus E1 because the photon gets destroyed. Um, we wouldn't be able to conserve energy otherwise. Whereas here, as long as you're going at l have at least enough can energy going in, you'll just lose this much energy. And in fact, a technique in, you can use to study atoms is something known as electron energy loss spectroscopy, where you go and throw an electron at the thine, and you actually count the electrons that bounce off and measure their energy, the measure how much the energy decreased by. And what that energy decreased by, that had to be what the energy of the atom increased by. Now there's a, a second issue here. Um, and this is that with absorption, the selection rules apply. So delta L has to be exactly plus or minus one. And nothing else. However, here the selection rules don't apply. And this is because it's not electromagnetic radiation, it's other processes. So delta L can equal anything. So for practical application, when you're doing spectroscopy, um, light-based light spectroscopy, everything you're looking at is going to uh, depend on the selection rules, so you can only see what are called allowed transitions. The electron energy loss spectroscopy I was mentioning can pick out forbidden transitions as well. Now the downside is that the way the technology works, the energy resolution for electron energy loss spectroscopy is nowhere near as good as it is for looking at photons. But the point is, is that, um, for, for instance, here, um, if we're taking a look at a, at a process, um, you know, we here, you know, this process here, say going from 3p to 3s, that's allowed. It's okay that the principal quantum number stayed the same. All that matters is that this changed. So this is allowed, um, but say going straight from 5s to 3s is forbidden. Sorry, I should be drawing excitations here. Forbid, I'm dug on. All right. There, let's do excitations, my bad. So this way is allowed. 
this way is forbidden. If you want to use lasers, say, to get us into the 5S state, you would have to first, you'd have to tune one laser to push something into 3P and then another laser to push it over from 3P to 5S. With collisional excitation, you can, as long as you got a, a particle that's at least 4.11 EV, you can chuck it right from here to there. That, that is a possible thing that can happen. And then emission works the opposite way. And again, it's the, um, for emission, um, that's always going to be for allowed transitions. Um, so let me just go ahead and rewrite that there. Um, so atomic emission Again, here, we're going to have to go um, into, we're going to have to follow the, because we're emitting photons, we're going to have to follow the selection rules. And so let's go ahead and take a look at, let's say, the transition down from 3P to 3S in our sodium, like this, and we're going to emit a photon. Um, we remember that the um, energy of the uh, first excited state is 2.1 EV above the ground state. So to calculate the wavelength of my photon here, I can say the difference in energy here would be the energy of the photon I created. You can always write that as HC, but here, or, sorry, HF, but here will be more productive to write as HC over lambda. So in the wavelength will be HC over delta E. And it's super duper convenient to remember that H times C is 1240 EV nanometers. Um, and we'll be dividing that by our 2.1 EV. And you get 590 nanometers. Now before anyone gets all twisted at me, yes, I know that emission line in sodium, which is really bright yellow, is 589. Um, I'm rounding a little too much here. And by the way, that particular mission line is used for calibration of a lot of spectroscopic equipment because you have a bright yellow line and then kind of nearby is a dimmer yellow line, but you just can't miss that bright yellow line. All right. So that's what happens if we're dealing with the valence things. But let's go back to, remember a few videos ago, I showed you some dental x-rays and we were taking a look at x-rays. What's happening with x-ray emission? Um, and I don't hyphenate it because I have been thoroughly told that in this case, X is just a word all by itself. But you should make sure that if you go across a line, keep X and Ray together, or else people will be really confused by a lone letter X sitting at the end of the line. All right, so here's the deal. Um, once you start filling electron shells, remember how I said with a closed shell, it's basically just interacting with the proton and whatever closed shell with the nucleus and whatever closed shells are underneath. And so you wind up being in very low energy states. Um, so I'm going to kind of draw a few of those um, shells. Might look something like that. Um, by convention, the closest of the shells gets called K and then the next one is L and then the next one is M and so forth. And these are any this turns out to be n equals 1, n equals 2 and n equals 3. Now why did they get these names K shell L shell M shell? The rather sad story. If you remember before I mentioned about um, spectroscopic notation, 
that you know l equals zero is s and then l equals one is p and then d and then f and that's because that stood for sharp principle diffuse and fundamental um, and then they eventually realized it had to do with angular momentum states well when they're working with x-rays they knew that when they're looking at the structures they knew that it had to involve atomic shells but since they didn't want to repeat the spdf debacle they decided to name the first one that they saw k so that there would be letters underneath K. Turns out it's the easiest one to see. So they saw N equals 1 first and called it K and reserved all this room underneath K that wasn't needed, so they could have just called it A. But they didn't, so it's called K, and we have to live with that. All right. So what's go so generally speaking, when you make an, an X-ray, what you do is you fire an electron really hard at one of these inner shells. Like, let's say we manage to strike the K shell as an example. What will happen is a lot of times this, the electron will probably fly, will fly on through, but it'll take one of the electrons that's in here. So we'll say that one flies on through. It'll take a different electron that happened to be in the shell and it'll chuck it up into a very high orbit. Um, n equals some very large number. And so then what happens is you sort of get this chain reaction. Um, the electron that's sitting here in the uh, L shell suddenly sees the shielding of this drop by a bunch. You know, say you've got, you know, 50 protons sitting here and you had two electrons orbiting and now it's one. That's an effective, you went from an effective charge of 49, 48 to 49. So it, one, so one of the electrons that's here will very desperately want to get down here. And so generally, it doesn't have to be purely from M, L into K. It could be M into K or whatever. The most probable is uh, L into K. And then that'll leave a hole behind here, which gets filled by somebody who fell in from a higher one again. Again, it doesn't have to be from M to L, maybe it was from N to L, something like that. Again, those are your most probable. Now the deal is, is with these closed shells, like I said, the energies are incredibly low. So if we go and put the ionization limit back at zero EV, um, you could very well end up with, say, your 1s state sitting at around negative 9,000 EV. Um, and then your 2s state is incredibly energetic at about, I'll say negative 2,000 here, around 1,000-ish. And yeah, 2p will be a little more energetic than 2s, and I dare you to tell the dif be able to tell the difference at this scale. Um, then, you know, 3s is basically, you know, say if this was uh, um, back to sodium, 3s is basically at zero. I'm trying to draw it just barely underneath zero, but anything I draw at this scale is frankly too close to zero, or too, too far away from zero. But anyway, so one of our electrons gets kicked up into higher, some higher bit, um, this guy out here, he's going to take a long time to get back because he's only seen an effective charge of one and he's far away. Um, he'll make it back eventually, but like I say, you'll have these inner shell transitions happening in between. So you'll have, say, here, 2s, 2p, or sorry, from 2p and 3p to 1s. And remember, we can't fall from... 3s to 2s, for instance, by allowed processes. So this one here, um, the 2p to 1s, um, general rule of thumb, you higher the energy, the shorter, um, the shorter the wavelength. So this will be something like 0.139 nanometers. Um, I'm sorry, my bad. This one will be 0.139 nanometers from 3p to 1s. 2p to 1s, being a little lower energy, will be a little longer wavelength, 0.159 nanometers. Now, compared to hundreds of nanometers for 
valence electron uh, processes. This is in a totally different kettle of fish. And here, that's why we, you know, you know one electron can do, or one x-ray can do an awful lot of damage to an awful lot of molecules. All right, I'll finish this up with one last little thought, and that's the laser. So laser is a is an acronym actually, um, and normally you'd write acronyms all in capital letters, but um, in part due to British influence and in part due to this basically just having become a word, um, we it's we usually don't write it all in caps anymore. But it stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Um, so that's a mouthful. So what does that mean? Uh, the key point here is that certain states, um, states um, have rather long lifetimes. Like notoriously, the 2s state of atomic hydrogen takes about a seventh of a second to finally via forbidden transitions work its way back down to 1s. Whereas 2p is, you know, on the order of microseconds um, to make its way back down to 1s. So, yeah. Um, so these states get a name. They get called metastable states. So and that's because they're not stable, but they hang around in this unstable state for what on an atomic scale seems like forever. Now the thing is, is that you can still, um, for you, you can still, if you have a properly tuned photon come in, and in this case we do need the selection rules to work out. Um, what you can do is you can um, uh, cause the um, electron to go from the lower state to the higher state. Now, since this is a metastable state, it'll sit there. Now, or, or sorry, um, for, for a moment, I'm just doing um, absorption and, sorry, this is stimulated absorption, it's called. And if and if this is isn't a and um, it, if you sit around and wait long enough, eventually the photon will leave. Even if you're sitting in a metastable state, that's called um, spontaneous emission. But then here's the thing, because once you've got, if you've managed to by stimulated absorption get a whole lot of electrons, a whole lot of atoms all sitting in this higher state, E2. Um, since it takes a good long time to go down to E1, something weird can happen. When one of them finally does decide to emit, that photon will come by. And because it just happens to match the frequency that this wants to emit, that will encourage this to transition down this photon continues to go on by, but now we've emitted another photon. And these two are what we call coherent. Um, so this is stimulated emission. And these two photons are coherent, which means that if we think about their waves, their waves match up. Now in a laser, you pump a whole lot of, you, you somehow or other get a whole lot of atoms or whatever you're lasing, um, yeah, the verb is to laze, um, into higher states. And then once the stimulated emission, once you get a spontaneous emission happen, um, then 
suddenly you set off the, a chain reaction because the, it hits some other atom and now you get two photons and those two photons will find other atoms and get more photons out and so you get this big chain reaction and all of these um, photons are in sync with each other and so you get a very narrow coherent beam of light leaving the cavity. Um, this is the basis for things like uh, fiber optic transmission of data and stuff like that. The laser is used to encode the ones and the zeros. Okay, so that will go ahead and do it for atoms and molecules. Um, going forward, we will uh, turn our attention to the nuclei themselves. So catch you over there.